Hey, my name is Randy and I'm the Cheap Audio Man. If you're new here, consider subscribing. Hit the like button and turn on notifications so you know when all my awesome videos, and I use awesome in quotation, awesome videos go up on the internet. Today we're talking about why audio files are full of crap. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee, and let's talk, let's talk about why audio files are full of crap. Today's sponsor comes from Sith Audio, as usual, and it is audiophile resealable plastic bags. Some people call them Ziplocs. You can put your snacks in here. Pringles, maybe some Ritz crackers, a sandwich, a whole bunch of record player cartridges. You can put them all in here because it's certified to make everything inside it audiophile. Audiophile. Anything you can fit in here magically makes it an audiophile component. And that's what we're going to talk today about today. We're gonna to talk today about why I feel some, okay? I'm not gonna pigeonhole everybody, paint with super broad strokes. Why I feel some audiophiles are full of bull crap, or steer crap, or heifer crap. Any of the cows that have the crap. Reason number one, I hear this, and I hear this in the, in the comments, and the reason why I'm making this video is there are themes. And I've heard it in the comments. I've gotten emails about it. People are very passionate about telling me why I'm wrong and telling other people why they're wrong. Here's the number one, one thing that I think uh, why audio files are full of crap. Number one, I don't know if we're going to do numbers. That's not how the artist intended it. So if your speakers, and this is mostly due to speakers, if your speakers don't measure a certain way, if, they, if they're not flat measuring. The argument there is that's not how the artist intended the music to sound like. That's the argument. Really. I would, I would argue back, were you at the recording? Did you hear what the music sounded like uh, coming out of the studio monitors? Did you hear the band go, yep, that's it, when they agree to the recording? Not only that, I have heard anecdotal evidence that some bands approve the final master listening to it in a car or over MP3s and crappy headphones, or even when one of their managers is holding a phone up like this and they're listening to it on the other end. That's how they're approving their masters. Not through some crazy hi-fi stereo, they're approving their masters through car stereo. And I wonder how that car stereo measures. I wonder if it's flat measuring, if there's a bump here or there, or if it's perfect. If you weren't at the recording, if you weren't sitting with the band when they approved the master, maybe they didn't even approve the master. Uh, bands, for the most part, I mean, with, it, with the exception of like live performances or where there's a performance and it's in one space, it's kind of one take and they're not really slicing things up. Outside of that, nobody really knows what the music was intended to sound like. Outside of a concert, and here, even at a concert, so you're at a concert, right? Maybe it's a big concert. Maybe it's a stadium-sized concert, okay? And you have the, the sound booth in the middle, in front of the stage, right? And they're doing sound check. And they're dialing in all the levels. To get it to sound like that, where? At the sound booth. Because guess what? There's speakers up front, there's a sound system around. It doesn't mean everyone's gonna actually hear the same thing. So even at, and I'm assuming that the reason why the sound booth guy is employed is because the band approves his approval. So if he just says, yeah, that's how it, okay, the band probably says, yeah, that's how we want it to sound. But it sounds like that in the sound booth or the sound area in the concert. What if you're to the right, to the left, all the way up front, all the way up back in the nosebleed section? So even at a concert, a live concert, you might not be listening to it as the artist intended it because you're not exactly where they did the tweaking. Point being, nobody really knows what it sounded like or what the artist's intention were. Nobody, because they may have approved that master over a crappy car stereo we don't know that so if anybody ever says your speakers need to measure a certain way 
or you shouldn't have tone controls, or you shouldn't have EQ because that's not how the artist intended it, it's dumb. That's a dumb argument. Plus it's your music. You can listen to it however you want to. Another thing that drives me crazy is your music is garbage because I actually do listen to a band called Garbage. It's all them in concert with Alanis Morissette. It was lovely. My music is garbage because it's compressed. Yeah, so compression. You may have heard of the loudness wars. Started back in the, uh, actually I think it was the 40s. So Motown Records, a lot of the times would run a hot record, which means they'd bring up the levels. People that would listen to music through juke, juke boxes back then would have a tendency to prefer louder songs. Our friends at the Beatles, very good band, they wanted to be commercially successful. They started to record their music a little bit louder. And then you know how it goes. It just kept going and going and going until it, it, until it finally ended with my beloved Metallica's Death Magnetic, where it was so compressed it sounded like garbage. Okay, some people would say that all Metallica art albums sound like garbage. That's fine. You do you, I'm going to do me. To say that a recording or an artist isn't audiophile, all right, so let's just, what does audiophile mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It's subjective, right? It's a moving target, right? Why do some people get to label their stuff audiophile while others do not? Is there an application process? I know of only one certification process. Uh, it's the Audiophile Measurement Standards and Certification Committee. And the only reason I know about that one is because I started the website <laughs> as a joke. That's right, AskMac.org is a joke about all this. Okay, this is one of my favorites, personally. That speaker is only going to sound good on a high-end system. High end. And I got this argument when I listened to the Kev LS50s, and guess what? I didn't like them. Okay? I, I get to do that. Some people don't like things. I didn't like the Kev LS50. The comments that I got, and there was an overwhelming theme, that only works with a high end amplifier. Okay. Perfect. Well, I had a $2,500 amplifier on it. Is that not good enough? Well, it needs to be this, 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 and that. So, if and I actually heard this from a manufacturer because I gave, anyway, a manufacturer told me that I'm only going to be able to tell the differences if I'm on a high end system. And boy, oh boy, did I have a long heated conversation, spirited, spirited conversation with them. What is high end? What is a high end system? What is a high end amp? And if the product only works best with a high-end component or a high-end amp, why isn't it certified with some components? Why don't you go to their web page and say, it only works with or works best with, works okay with, and have a list. Hey, if you're a manufacturer, you're going to say, this, does, this isn't going to perform well unless it's with a certain amp, then maybe you should test it out with a bunch of amps and tell us which ones it works best with which ones it works okay with, and which amps you wouldn't recommend. But don't make us, the consumer, go out there and guess and go buy a whole bunch of stuff just to find out that, oh, well, we didn't find the perfect pairing for your fickle little speaker. If I ever hear that you need to be on a high-end system, ooh, come on down to Cam Studios. Let's talk about that face-to-face. That system all in when I first got, that's the, that's the reason why the, the channel started, is a Kef LS50 and the Moon by Sim Audio 240i, okay? That's the reason why this started. And people, oh, well, you didn't have enough power. What? No, no, it's $2,500. It's 50 watts of clean power. It's got a huge transformer. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If, if it doesn't work, tell me what. Put it on the side of the box. Put it in the owner's manual. Tell us what your... Fancy, special, snowflake speaker. Tell us what amps it works with so that we can have a more enjoyable experience by giving you our hard-earned money. Here's a good one. Hi-Fi, high-end, starts at X amount. X. Some arbitrary number. It just starts at three grand, two grand. It just starts there. 
Anything is $19.99. Nope, they're mid-fi. Two grand, that's hi-fi. Who gets to determine this? I actually saw a video, and I couldn't make it through the entirety of the video. I saw a video that literally, and I'm giving you the Reader's Digest first. The guy said, oh yeah, if, if your DAX less than $5,000, it's just garbage. It's not going to be good. You, you need at least a $5,000 DAC. Really? What if it goes on sale? Down to 3500 <laughs> Okay. What if some company was going through a dealer network and all of a sudden they decided, guess what? We're not going to go through a dealer network anymore. We're going to cut our prices and sell at 40% less while increasing our own margin. What happens then? Because that that product used to be five grand. Now maybe it's 3,500. Is that not good anymore? So thinking about hi-fi and components based on price is dumb there's no magic number there's no magic threshold that says okay whoop, maybe maybe i'll concede to this that maybe the finish you can maybe say this is a high-end finish on a speaker if it costs i don't know two grand to make three grand to make a grand to put the finish on there whatever it is you can say that yeah this is a high-end speaker because it costs a grand to do this paint job whatever outside of that no you can't who who, 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 that sounds like an owl, is determining what threshold is high end. And think about technology. Think about speaker modeling, uh, electronic crossover modeling, enclosure modeling. How to get different sounds. I mean, materials. Think about that. So with all this technology and economies of scale, all of a sudden, it's, it just, it, that, that's the worst argument that, High-end audio starts at a certain amount of money. Don't let anybody tell you that high-end starts at a certain price. That's crazy. That's, I, I don't know, I don't even know what, I don't even have an analogy for that. It's like saying if the, your car has to, co has to cost 50 grand for it to be good. Really? I mean, I'm sure there's cars out there that cost 30 grand, they're good, but I don't know. Okay, as soon as I hit 50 grand, we're in the club now. You're in the good car club. You're in the good hi-fi Hi-Fi Equipment Club, Who, who's determining what this what this is? Is it the dealers? The Hi-Fi dealers that go in and they carry the expensive, the real expensive stuff, okay? Is it them? Is it them that, who, who's deciding? Okay, kind of like the tail wagging of the dog. And guess what? If that goes on the used market or even a demo unit, 50%, that's what that component's worth. 50%, sometimes less than 50% on the used market. Open box, you know, maybe 75, 85%, okay? They have margin in there, basically double. So if it's 2,500, the dealer's probably getting it for 1,250. Double, double, it's a lot of margin. That's, I've worked in a few industries and that's a high margin. And everyone, everyone is talking about, oh, it's too bad that Hi-Fi Hi-Fi stores are going out of business. Well, they shouldn't be. They're making a ton of money compared to other industries. I have zero ties to the the Hi-Fi stereo industry or audio industry in general. And I know some people that even are on this platform. You know, I have did this. I've been in the industry for this long, that long. Guess what? I never have. Doesn't matter. I have ears. I have, you know, I probably really started listening to music pretty hard when I was you know, about eight. So I have over like 37 years of listening experience. Oh, it's through low-end audio. Okay. What if it was really good back then? Is it still low-end? What, what about this? What about the CD players that came out like in 1988? All right. Like a $3,000 CD player, which most people would agree sounds like garbage now compared to a very low-end CE player now. Okay, so now all of a sudden that high-end audio file CD player is bested by it. And I know that might not be a good example, but it's DAC technology. Okay, so DAC technology back then, that was good. Now it's good and cheaper. Okay, so is that an audio file DAC? I don't know. Is it? It's not as expensive if we're putting the threshold. Anyway, I think you get my point. So this topic brings out the worst in people, at least I think it is. I've gotten emails. I have gotten phone calls from somebody, who, and it was about the ELAC. And this guy took, like, I think he felt like it was his duty 
to the rest of the world that he set me straight and let me know that all the stuff I was recommending was garbage. Literally garbage. He would say that in some of the comments. He was talking about the ELAC Unify uh, reference. No, not the reference. The ELAC Unify 2.0. 2.0. He calls me because I mistakenly had my phone number in the signature line of my email. He calls me. I answer and we talk. He's going on and on about how, no, it's got to be this, it's got to be that, it's got to be that. And I said, how much time have you spent A being the ELAC Unify 2.0 to whatever your high-end speaker is that you bought at a dealer and you paid in a ginormous markup on? How many, time, how long have you A beat him? Oh, well, I haven't. Oh, well, what was your impressions when you heard the speaker? Well, I've never heard the speaker. Never heard the speaker, huh? So if you're out there, you're typing away, you got your fancy, in your fancy speakers in the other room, fancy, fancy audiophile stuff on the, on the floor. You got your audiophile monoblocks on the floor. Why can't we get them up? Are they too heavy? Do we not, that not make stands that fit them? Okay. If you've never heard something, no bash on it. It's called contempt prior to investigation. And that's ignorance personified. Okay. It's saying you don't like something when you've never actually touched it, tasted it, felt it, heard it, spent any time with it. Just vilifying something that you don't know anything about, that maybe you don't understand. Having ideas about something, but not spending any time with it. I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> Don't crap all over something if you've never heard it. Because you're dumb if you do. That's stupid. That's like saying... Uh, that's like never having a food. Like just saying, uh, you know what? Uh, meat's stupid. It tastes like garbage. Chicken's dumb. Or salad's dumb. Spinach is dumb. Honey mustard's dumb. <laughs> Try it. Try it. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. It's no big deal. So, if you want to support the channel, which this probably this video probably makes a whole bunch of people want to support the channel. If you want to support the channel, you can sign up for Patreon, patreon.com slash cheap audio man. Every Sunday night, we have Patreon only Zooms. We also have a patron only Facebook group. You can also sign up for Amazon Music. It's probably not audiophile grade music. Uh, sign up for Amazon Music. There's a link in the description. You get a few free months. You may even get a few free months of Disney Plus. I get a couple of dollars. You can also use some of my links that are in the description. Those are products that I like and I re recommend. If you use those links, it doesn't cost you any more, but I get a small commission. So don't binge watch anything. Binge listen. Binge. You can binge watch movies and stuff like that. Binge listen. And fill your soul with happiness on your system. And if it's audio, if you want it to be audio, guess what? It's audio file. I'm Randy. I'm the cheap audio man.